hard and soft, male and female. We take them to market, caught in pots, traps, nets, hand lines baited with chicken necks. It is commerce and sport, also culture, but ultimately it is art, the art of crabbing, an artistry underwritten by the blue crab. There's a dance unique to the crab potter's craft, a hard driving herky-jerky rhythm. Full speed ahead, they roar to the corks that mark their baited traps. Almost in one fluid motion, hard reverse, neutral, hook the cork and hoist the catch, jam in fresh bait, dump the crabs, heave the pot back to fish again, full throttle to the next pot, 500 more to go. From Haverty Grace to Virginia Beach, up the Chop Tank and Potomac, into Baltimore's harbor, and Virginia's remotest seaside guts, more crabbers join the great dance. Gliding slowly along the marsh edges come the scrapers, seeking soft crabs. Sunrise casts the eastern horizon in violets and pinks. The quickening light coaxes the colors of goldenrod and creamy blooming baccarus from the marshes. Upriver, the trot liner bends over bait, slipping through his roller, poised with all the focus of a great blue heron about to strike. In the grassy marshes, dip netters sally forth, perched surfer-like on the very bow tip of their little wooden skiffs, pivoting, bracing, turning, shooting forward by pushing their long-handled dip nets against the shallow bottom. All have their peculiar signatures, their rhythms, and their seasons under the Chesapeake sun. If water quality does go south in the Chesapeake, perhaps we can learn to farm crabs inland or import all our crab meat. That might satisfy our taste for crab, but our souls would hunger. Commercial crabbing in the Chesapeake Bay reveals itself very slowly to the outsider. Many who cruise the Chesapeake for pleasure are unaware that right under their bows, so to speak, a major national fishery quietly goes about its business. I cannot say exactly why this is so, but come late spring and summer, we tend to ignore the crabber. Perhaps it is because his early hours are not our hours or the waters he works are, for the most part, marshy, buggy, and far removed from our choice cruising grounds. We do not much really think of him, unless by chance we have to steer through a forest of bobbing pot buoys. We curse gently, pray that we will not pick up a warp in our propellers, and continue on our way. It comes as a surprise, therefore, to learn in time that the Chesapeake has provided more crabs for human consumption than any body of water in the world, great oceans included. Been almost 40 years now since William Warner, a New York, New Jersey boy, awakened us Chesapeake natives to the fascinating commerce, ecology, and sociology of Kalanectes sapidus, that savory, beautiful swimmer, the Chesapeake Bay blue crab. Maybe it took an outsider to appreciate what we born hearers grew up with. For the past year, inspired by my late friend Willie, I've roamed the Chesapeake to find out what's happened to crabs and crabbers over the last four decades, and what's next. My journey brought me back to Tylerton on Smith Island, where I lived for three years in a waterman's culture that was underwritten and defined by the blue crab. I came to appreciate here how a book on harvesting the Chesapeake could command national attention. Warner discovered one of the most unique ways of crabbing in Ewell, the town of Smith Island accessible from Tylerton through the windy, shallow marsh guts of Tangier Sound. The thoroughfare, or the narrow waterway that is the main street of the village of Ewell on Smith Island, was coming alive at its customary hour. Then it came, the noise of a strange motor, cranky, skipping a beat now and then, 
and much higher pitched than the satisfying deep-throated throbs of the potting boats that had gone by earlier. Soon, it glided into view by the lights of the gas dock. It was a workboat unlike any other I had ever seen on the bay. The boat was small, about 30 feet length overall, I guessed. Its freeboard amidships was questionable, being not more than 18 inches from the waterline to the rail. But as the odd craft came closer, I saw that in spite of its exaggerated beam, it had a certain grace of line that unmistakably spoke of former days under sail. The mysterious craft Warner described was a scrape boat, or bar cat as they call it down on Tangier Island, or Jenkins Creeker over in Crisfield. And its young captain is still a scraping for crabs, same as half a century ago when he introduced the author to the art of soft crabbing. Well, Morris Goodman, what most people call me, I've been working on the water for 60 years. I learned how to crab scrape from my father and grandfather. They did it. The way that a scrape boat is built, there's a very shallow draft. And the more shallow the boat is, the easier it is to dump the scrape. And uh, you just drag these triangular scrapes with an eight-foot bag around through the grass. The scrape, when it's full of grass, might weigh 70 or 80 pounds. You don't want to have to raise that too much. Some people use these big boats with one in rigs, but they can't get in where we can. The bags is nylon. They used to be cotton. You'd have to change them about every three weeks. Some people keep them all year, but I can't catch as many when they draw up. You can't go through the water as fast, Tom. You can't drag them as fast. Scraping is, is about the hardest way. You don't have to uh, put out all the money that they do for crab potting, but you uh, do more work. I met William Warner about, I guess, 40 years ago. We got to talk and asked me if I, he could go out. I said, sure. I said, about four o'clock, be down to the old dock. And I picked him up and he stayed all day. That night, I went to sleep soundly soon after eating. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning. Perhaps Morris Goodwin and his friends would have a pleasant day on the water and maybe the long awaited second run might begin but I knew that I could not possibly have gone out with them again. I returned to sleep gratefully. A typical crabbing day for me would be, I get up about 3, 3.30, and we come over here and we fish up. Fishing up entails keeping the peeler crabs in tanks until they molt and firm up just enough to make the trip to market. If they're packed up too soon, they'll die. If they're left in too long, they'll start to turn hard again. Morris Goodwin and his son, Alan, fish up before dawn and then set out to scrape. We go and we stay until about one o'clock, maybe at 1.30. It depends on the tide, how long we stay. And we come in and we fish up again and uh, put our crabs out. Don't take much out, just chip some out of it. And that evening, we come over again about six or seven and fish them up again, pack all them up and get them ready to go the next morning. That's day in and day out. Sundays, we don't work crabbing, but we, we still have to fish up. So Morris Goodwin goes about his long, hot day pretty much as he did 60 years ago. Scrapers only account for about 1% of the Chesapeake crab harvest now, which doesn't deter Morris in the slightest. Well, as long as I can get my boots on, I guess I'll try it. Morris Goodwin Marsh has owned several scrape boats over 60 years, but his friend Davy Laird is still using his father's boat built in 1937. Well, this is one of my favorite types of bay boats, one that I really did not know about until I read uh, the chapter in Beautiful Swimmers on uh, scrape boats and soft crabbing. This one, Scotty Boy, was uh, built around 1937. Uh, so was its owner. They're both uh, 
pushing 80 now and both going strong. The blue crab hides in the grass beds and shallows to shed its shell and this boat was built to take advantage of that and, and pursue it there. The bay. There is no possible confusion with any other body of water. No need for more precise description. It is, after all, the continent's largest estuary. Its waters are rich. The main supply of oysters, crabs, clams, and other seafoods for much of the Atlantic seaboard. But it is in the stocks of the familiar Atlantic blue crab that the bay's bounty stretches belief. No body of water in the world has been more intensively fished for crabs than the Chesapeake, nor for a longer period with such successful result. In 1976, Warner reported about half the blue crabs caught commercially in the United States came from Chesapeake Bay. Today, it's a quarter to a third. The bay back then also produced nearly all of the nation's succulent soft shells, the stage where the crab has shed its hard shell to grow. That's changed too, as people from the Carolinas to the Gulf Coast have decided shedding soft crabs is worth the considerable effort. Grant Corbin was the focus of two chapters in Beautiful Swimmers. Corbin gets his peeler pots ready for the new season each March. The shiny bare metal of the crab pots described in Beautiful Swimmers is now painted with anti-fouling paint. A pollution tax is what Corbin calls it. When I first started crabbing, the pot would stay just that clean from the time you put her old board till you quit. Now, that's the way they foul. I got probably 3,000 hours worth of paint yesterday that if it weren't for pollution, I wouldn't even have to paint them. But it's got awful. And the paint's not even helping that much no more. Cost a lot of money to do this job. And then you, most time I got two men hard and it'll cost me every week right around $3,000 just to sh slack my lines up from the wharf. I got to make 3000 before I make a penny. Now soft crabs is high. That's the reason we do it. We can get as much for a dozen soft crabs as you can get for a bushel of crabs. Commercial crabbing in Maryland begins April 1. But because of the cold winter, Corbin and other crabbers delay putting out their pots until May. All right, I think that's gonna be what we're gonna go with now so I can see what's what. Yeah, cause I really don't know how rough it's gonna be. It ain't mine, but I don't want to roll them old boards, slack us up. The reason I didn't pile her up because I know it's gonna be rolling once I got here due to the western side sign. Now we throw these old board and these piece of bait in them, which it's against the law to put bait in them in a peeler pot. All right. Usually you leave your pot two days. If you leave it three days, you'll lose a lot of crabs. They'll eat up and you can't shed them. So you've got to leave them no more than two days. Crabs go in there to shed, they go in there for protection. Right. Nothing but mainly the peelers go in. Not, not in a lot of hard crabs. Right. They're hiding from fish and from predators. They don't know that they're going to a bad spot. It's mid-June on Deal Island, still a couple of hours until dawn when we board the Chesapeake Bay workboat Lady Ellen with Corbin and his two mates for a long day of peeler potting, fishing unbaited crab pots in the waters of Tangier Sound. Culling and sorting is part of the art of crabbing. Keep the ones that measure legal size, put the jimmies, the hard shell males, in one bushel, sooks or females in another, and peelers in various stages of readiness to shed to each their own container. Crabs molt every three to five days when they are tiny, but the interval spaces out to 20 to 50 days as they grow large. The process also becomes more difficult, requiring as much as three hours of labored wriggling for big crabs. When it is done, the crab is tired, utterly defenseless, and the favorite food of a great many fishes. Corbin has trained his grandson, James, how to determine when a crab is about to molt. If they're not done right, it's no need to catch them. And when I say right, I mean perfect. 
Because if you get your crabs mixed up, you're not going to shed any. And if you don't shed them, there's no need to catch them. Because what we're catching means nothing if I can't get soft crabs out of them. Bringing back clean water and good habitat is critical for healthy seafood harvests. Since the early 1970s, the bay's gotten fat, eutrophic, scientists call it. Coliform bacteria and disease, atomic plant pass-throughs, siltation caused reduced photosynthetic capabilities, oxygen deprivation, nutrient loading, and the doubling rate. They all had those long names, and I doubted many watermen understood the full threat of their quiet and insidious workings. Perhaps it was easier to put it the way they do. You look hard at the water, and sometimes it seems like it's getting a little old and tired, a little messy. Simple as that, if anyone cares to notice. Eddie Evans is seeing the same thing around his native Smith Island, visible evidence of water pollution. Some of our lines is that big rain with, with uh, what we call hair growing on it. Crab pots, if you look at them across there, you can't even see through them. It's late 50s, early 60s, we never had, we never seen them this time. You could put a crab pot overboard and it would stay the whole year, just as clean as it was when you put it out in the spring. We didn't have all this stuff to contend with. Back in the 60s, 70s, the chicken industry really began to take off. And the more the chicken industry began to take off, the more this hire began to come on. Ken Smith is president of the Virginia Watermen's Association. We've got a dirty workplace. Anybody else that had to work in a dirty workplace, they'd have somewhere they could go and a janitorial service would come in and clean it up for them. But we can't do anything on that again because here's the politics again. Between the farmers talking about how it's hard for them and the developers talking about how hard it is for them. Grant Corbin and Eddie Evans see evidence of a dirty workplace every day on their pots. Morris Goodwin Marsh sees it in the loss of eelgrass, a favored habitat for his peeler crabs. Old timers when I lived here in the 1980s would show me places where once you could see lush eelgrass beds where crabs love to hide 10, 12 feet down. When the tide would get down, we'd go way out. Sometimes we're in five and six feet of water. And you can scrape it, plenty of grass. Eelgrass, even when I lived down here in the 80s, covered uh, most of this area on south down to the Virginia Capes. And now it's very hard to find. I'm surprised to find this nice little patch of it. Boy, this is just eelgrass at its shiny green spring fresh before any of the epiphytic slime that's fueled by too many nutrients kind of turns it all gray green and muddy looking. This is beautiful stuff. It's perfect habitat for shedding crabs and feeding waterfowl in the winter. And uh, most of it has been replaced by what they call old seedy grass. It's widgeon grass, which is fine habitat, but it's a, it's a much more pollution tolerant species. It comes and goes. It's not as stable an environment as eelgrass. When Willie wrote his book, probably one of the nicest passages in Beautiful Swimmers is his description of the eelgrass coming up all fresh and green and just alive with all manner of species. The forest will teem with life at all levels. Sluggish predators on the floor, maturing fish fry and hiding crustaceans in the luxuriant midsections, and darting minnows in the canopy. The scrape then comes along lifts it all in place and deposits it on the washboard for convenient inspection. It's likely that a thousand years ago, blue crab numbers in Chesapeake Bay had up years and down years. It's just the nature of the beast and of the bay's dynamic environmental conditions. Cold winters, increases in crab predators, even the direction of winds that blow baby crabs in or out of the bay, all these and more affect crab abundance. But generally, crab numbers appeared to remain healthy for more than a decade after Warner published Beautiful Swimmers, despite pollution concerns and ever more crab pots deployed. 
Then in the 90s, blue crabs went into a steepening decline that scientists, regulators, and crabbers have only recently managed to stabilize at a lot lower level in 1976. Tom Miller is director of the Chesapeake Biological Lab in Solomons, Maryland, and a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. We were alerted to the declines in abundance by concerns from the watermen themselves that their catches were going down, and by the surveys that scientists conduct to assess abundance. The principle of those surveys is the winter dredge survey, which was started by scientists here at Chesapeake Biological Lab in the late 1980s. It takes advantage of the fact that crabs overwinter in the sediment, not moving around, and it becomes much easier to survey their abundance. It's gonna measure at 123 millimeters. Weighs approximately 110 grams, almost identical to the previous crab. And it's the only survey we have uh, until very recent years that covered the entire Chesapeake Bay. On this mid-January day, the research vessel Bay Eagle and its crew from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, or VIMS, is counting blue crabs buried in the mud to predict how many will be available to harvest next like summer. This, we should have a pretty good year in terms of the dredge survey. Captain John Olney, Jr drags the bottom for precisely 60 seconds at each station, just as his Maryland counterpart does in the upper Chesapeake. Men and women of science on their hands and knees in oil skins on a cold, wet, and wind-whipped boat deck paw through clumps of mud, shell, and detritus dredged from the bay bottom. They are divining the future, making sense of a mysterious world, an age-old quest that stretches from magic to science, from shamans poking at the entrails of sacrifices to biologists sifting the guts of the bay for blue crabs down to the size of a fingernail clipping. Not seeing very much other than a lot of uh, sea squirts and this with the grass, what the watermen call grass, which is actually hydroid. Winter colony. survey only began coming into its own yeah, after about 10 years. Now, after about a quarter of a century, it's mature and gives crab managers excellent data on which to base harvest limits. First female. Pretty lady. Rom Lipsius is a professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. An individual female can produce two million offspring in a single batch. But if you, of course, fish out too many of the females, then the resilience will go down. So one of the, the I think key benefits of the winter dread survey is it allows us to assess just how much fishing mortality the blue crab can tolerate and therefore what kind of resilience we can provide in terms of fishery management as a buffer uh, against environmental disturbances. Those disturbances can be uh, things such as a natural disturbance, could be a hurricane, or it could be another type of biological disturbance like an unexpected explosion of a predator. So the main goal is to fish it sustainably, but also give it a buffer from these disturbances. And that's what we usually term resilience. Neither the Virginia or Maryland crews are interested in dredging where the most crabs are. They go to spots randomly selected by a computer. Where crabs are not is as important as where they are. Brenda Davis is chief of the Blue Crab Division of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. If you wanted to calculate the population of a city and you only went to houses that had 10 people in them, you would way overestimate the population. If you only went to vacant lots, you would underestimate the population. But by getting a random sample, you get a pretty accurate um, estimate of how many people are around in, in the census situation or how many crabs are around for what we do. It gives us a, a holistic picture of abundance in the way that other surveys don't. And it is very clear from those early years of that survey which started in 1989 that abundance declined sharply after about three or four years and was maintained at a very low level 
for at least a decade after that. Just as it's hard to overstate the importance of the winter dredge survey to science and management, it's hard to overstate how critical the Bi-State Blue Crab Advisory Committee was to crab politics. Ann Swanson is executive director of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, which created the Bi-State Blue Crab Advisory Committee in 1996. They essentially goosed Maryland and Virginia governments into working together for the first time in history on a cooperative solution to crab management. We began looking at, well, what should be the threshold? The point we will never fish beyond. What we did was we went back to 1968. 1968 was the lowest in recorded history. And so we knew that the population, if it was brought that low, could rebound. We didn't know what would happen below that. We had no idea. And so in that situation, we ended up saying, OK, well, if the threshold is going to be the 1968 levels, which translates to about leaving 10% of the crabs in the water, then we would back it away to 20%. So it took five years. We ultimately then delivered our recommendations. The Bi-State Blue Crab Commission recommended fairly traditional management of reducing effort, that is the number of pots that fishermen are allowed to use, or the number of days that they can deploy their pots, or in some cases the number of hours that they can be on the water. And um, that wasn't successful in bringing uh, crab abundance back up to the levels that we wanted to see. And so in 2008, I think the continued low level of abundance forced the management agencies to take a new look at how they could manage crabs. And what they decided upon, which I think was exactly the right thing to do, was that if you wanted to ensure a, an increase in abundance, you protected the females that were going to produce the next generation. Protecting the spawning female crabs is a focus in both Maryland and Virginia, but each state has its own way of doing it. The mature females come down to Virginia to bury in the bottom each winter and release their eggs the following summer. So spawning sanctuaries and closing a winter dredge fishery made sense there. Maryland conserves the females as they migrate through its waters with limits on catch size and the like. Within two or three years, crabs were up to abundance levels that we had uh, estimated were sustainable in the long term, that they would um, produce higher levels of catch, higher levels of profit for watermen. And by 2011, I, I think some of us uh, felt very good about the whole management regime and expected a smooth ride from then on. In 2012, the Winter Dredge Survey predicted accurately lots of crabs. But something happened between winter and summer, maybe unusual numbers of crab-eating fish. Watermen and scientists alike were confounded. 2012 was going to be a bumper year for abundance. The winter dredge survey, which measures the abundance of, of the young crabs who were born the previous summer, um, indicated that there was just a record high abundance of these young crabs. And so we expected the fishery that summer and autumn of 2012 to be one of the best fisheries that the bay had seen in a generation. By the end of the year, it was apparent that that tremendous abundance of blue crabs that we thought we had seen in the winter failed to materialize in the summer and autumn. And it's still uncertain what happened, but it was clear that blue crab had foxed us once again. Forty years ago, there were many unanswered questions about the enigmatic blue crab. We know a lot more now, but there's still plenty to learn. There are studies going on all around the bay to figure out the pressures affecting the blue crab. Everything from fishing to predators to climate change. I think climate change is probably the most important factor that we have to consider in the future both for the Chesapeake Bay as a whole, but in particular for blue crab. And so this experiment is being conducted by a PhD student here at 
Chesapeake Biological Lab that involves exposing crabs to current water temperatures and elevated water temperatures and then current levels of acidity and increased acidity that we think may be representative of conditions in the bay 75 years from now. better to do it on a low tide when they're coming out and seeking refuge in the seagrass rather than the marsh grass. Danielle McCulloch worked for Professor Lipsius at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. She's now pursuing a degree that will help her communicate science to the public. In 2012, uh, we saw an influx of red drum into the bay. In conjunction with the influx of red drum, we saw a decrease in the crab population. So our graduate student Mandy, she's working on a crab tethering study to look at predation of crabs and seagrass. And what's really interesting is she's using underwater GoPros to look and see if she can catch any of the predators actually taking the crabs off the tethers and then looking at the video later to see if there's any sort of trends or if we can just get some cool footage. And she wants to see if there's a correlation between an influx of predators and the population of crabs. So I think she's going to be analyzing uh, fish guts later to see what different fish species, how many of them um, predate on crabs exclusively. It's important to know what's out there, what is declining this crab population, because it might not always be just the fishery affecting it. Our winter dredge boat can't get into shallow water and it can't sample juvenile crabs. So what we do is we take a modified scrape and we use that to sample the grass beds and extract the juveniles that seek refuge in them. And that way we can get an idea of what the juvenile population is looking like. Last year the winter freeze caused very high mortality in juveniles, particularly those juveniles that remain in relatively shallow waters. And that's exactly what the crabs go for. We had upwards of 30% or higher mortality. We need to be aware that there are going to be these disturbances and that we can help the blue crab and its resilience to, to recover from them. What has happened in, in the Chesapeake that is unique in terms of fishery management, in my view, the management community, the politicians, the policy makers, the scientists and the crabbers themselves have come together and they have been talking and working together to try to improve the situation both for the blue crab population as well as for the fishery. I got a stark comparison of the bay we need versus the bay we're creating on a crab trawl survey with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, or CERC. We were in the Road River, a shallow sub-estuary of the Chesapeake, tucked into the shoreline just south of Annapolis. You'll find a few trot liners working here, but places like the road are mainly nurseries for juvenile crabs. Blue crabs require many different resources and ecosystem components of the Chesapeake Bay, and so trying to understand that throughout the life cycle of the blue crab has uh, been a real challenge. Anson Tuck Hines, search director, has been studying crabs since 1979 when he tied ping pong balls to their flippers with monofilament to track their movements. Since then, crab tracking methods have improved. We are currently in the Miles River and we're going to be heading downriver towards the mouth of Spencer Creek. We're going to be tagging some crabs. We get some crabs from a commercial trot liner. As soon as they come off his line, uh, they pass them over to us. We put a small tag across the, the back of the crab the, on the, the dorsal carapace. It's a one by two inch vinyl disc that's printed with a unique identification number along with uh, our contact information. So when recreational or commercial watermen uh, recapture these crabs, they can notify us to when and where uh, they caught it. And we can look at their movements, see where the crabs have gone and how long it took them to get there examining uh, who caught the crab, uh, how they caught the crab, look at fishery dynamics. These days, Heinz and his team are using telemetry and implanted electrodes that afford Smithsonian scientists exquisitely detailed views into the lives of young crabs, down to how many bites it takes them to finish off a small clam, about 100. And it turns out that each 
tributary system like the Rogue River or the Potomac River, or Chester River, various rivers, has a unique combination of trace metals that get deposited in the female shell at the time she molts to maturity and lays down that final shell. And we're testing the hypothesis that we can determine uh, the composition of the stock of females that are producing the eggs in the lower bay, how they uh, came into being, which nursery habitats were the most important in producing the most females. That would allow us to uh, devise uh, especially significant protection systems of those habitats from overfishing, from habitat degradation, and water quality. Well, when we started uh, trawling for uh, fish and crabs in the river in the 1980s, we would catch anywhere from 250 to 500 blue crabs in a trawl like that. Today, we probably what, caught 50, 60 crabs in one of those trawls. We've lost seagrasses from the river that were here before the 1970s uh, as a result of the deteriorating water quality. So that habitat has uh, been lost to, to blue crabs, but they've shifted their use into the shallow water uh, edges of the estuary as a critical habitat and to woody debris from the forested shoreline of branches and trees falling into the river. The Smithsonian's land, including 16 miles of unbroken forested edges that still dominate the Road River, still harbor in favor of blue crabs. It's the Chesapeake we want, but not the one we're creating. It's not just the big obvious problems, the dramatic losses of aquatic oxygen and seagrasses that's occurred as runoff from farms and cities and suburbs degraded water quality. It's also what we continue doing to impair the bay's thousands of miles of edges, those most productive merges of beach and shallows and wetlands, where so much of the estuary's life, including us, wants to hang out. To our north, as we trawled with Tuck, lay walls of rock protecting neat lawns and homes from erosion. No woody debris there, no protective shallows for little crabs either. I've kayaked all the way around the Delmarva Peninsula twice now, 2005 and 2015, you get a real good look at four miles an hour for 500 miles, and you see the dramatic increase in shoreline armoring throughout Maryland and Virginia. When you lay this rock along the shoreline, you're, you're really disrupting some of the most vital habitat the bay's got. They've done it pretty sensitively here uh, by putting the rock offshore, it, it preserves a lot of the nearshore shallows that are so essential to uh, little blue crab habitat. Unfortunately, the bulk of shoreline armoring around the Chesapeake is not done this way. It is still just laying the rock right up on the bank and that can really wreck the habitat for blue crab. Jack Travelstead, recently retired, has been a top crab manager in Virginia for the last few decades. Climate change, hardening of the shoreline, predation by various predators in Chesapeake Bay, all of these things are affecting the crab population. But the good thing is we can no longer uh, blame the declines that we're seeing in the resource on fishing. That's under control and that's a good thing. There's always going to be restrictions. You know, we've got to avoid the days of old where there was free access to the fishery, where people could come and go. As the population got healthy, more and more people got into the fishery, and then it would decline, and you'd start the whole process over again. We're going to have to avoid that, and we still have to protect the spawning stock. When Willie Warner crabbed with Grant Corbin, the only regulation was a size limit. Oh, 40 years ago, no limit. It was a size limit, but no hour limit, it weren't no limit at all. Now there are dozens of regulations, and they differ state by state. You've got some air restrictions, like on females, a certain amount you can catch. You used to be able to catch all you want. You worked as many hours as you wanted, because on the water you get it when it's there. If it's there, you don't say, I'm going to quit early and go in, I'll get it another day. Corbin could be speaking for a lot of Maryland watermen. Crabbers in Virginia have seen even more dramatic changes in their rules. In 1976, Willie Warner wrote a whole chapter about crab dredging down there, 
but a ban on winter dredging put an end to that, or at least an ongoing hiatus. Lonnie Moore of Tangier Island was a longtime crab dredger. This one here is a crab dredge, and this is a crab dredge, and they, they shackle solid by solid, you know, to make 16 foot of dredge. And this that top one is an oyster dredge that, you know, that, has, that they use out here for the oyster dredge. You can see the difference three and a half feet versus eight feet, plus they use two of these. It used to be that everywhere you'd walk up here, you'd see dredges packed everywhere because you had 60 boats one time out here dredging crabs, you know, right out of Tangier alone. I guess it was in 2000, I sold my crab dredge rig and I still don't ever plan on doing it again, but there's some people around here that would really love to do it and it would be good for the economy of this town. If we could take 15 and a half of the boats out of oyster and put back into the crab and would help oysters also, and I don't think it would hurt the crab population one bit. That's my personal thought, I really don't. This stuff of protecting the spawning stock has gotten absurd. They're talking about stopping winter dredge crab and like that's preserving the, the spawning stock. But at the same time, Everybody's going down the bay now with crab pots, and those crabs that they could have caught in the winter time, they're catching the same crab now, but they're catching it in the spring, and they're not getting anywhere near the money for it. Plus, it's taken Virginia out of a year-round market. Now listen to what Smith's saying, because he's not arguing for more crabs, rather to shift catch from spring to winter in a way he thinks will make watermen more money and kill fewer crabs. That's controversial politically, but ecologically, it's quite progressive. Another controversial policy under consideration would set quotas. Quotas, catch shares, call them what you may. They deserve a good hard look. Most find the concept attractive. The state sets overall limits on what you can take and make sure they can measure accurately what you're taking and then you can fish any way, any time you want. Unfortunately, as managers, what we're trying to do with a lot of our regulations is make people inefficient in how they crab by well, that's, that's telling them what is, day of yeah. the week they can go crabbing or how much yeah. they can crab or how many pots. I think it's pretty easy to understand a quota. This is the amount you can safely remove uh, by harvesting. And if you don't exceed it, the population is going to be sustainable. For that kind of management to be effective, the jurisdictions need to know almost daily how much crabbers are taking. The paper reporting system that's been used can't do that. In Maryland, there's a pilot system to do it electronically. On Smith Island, where cell service is sketchy, Eddie Evans does his daily report by landline. Time I go in there and pick up the phone, and I can be all through with it in less than five minutes and I don't have anything else to do with it. Uh, to me, it works out pretty good. The benefits that they explained to us would be if they got, if the state had instant reports that they would know daily what was coming in, then they could ease up on restrictions. Okay. The other way, uh, they didn't get my information for 30 days. At the end of each month, you sent that form in. It was a monthly form. So now then, they know every day exactly what I'm catching. When I get started on the website, I log in to my account. The first screen lets me um, pick which fishery I want to go to, blue crabs. For CJ Canby, who was born two years after Beautiful Swimmers was published. Electronic communication is nothing new, but he isn't comfortable with all the questions he has to answer. I would be in favor of electronic reporting across the fishery if they remove some of the intrusion in it. Knowing all the information of when we're coming in and when we're going out, um, you know, where you're selling your crab, restaurants, public or personal, those are the types of things that are intrusive that they don't really need to know. If we report at the end of the day what we caught, they would know all the information that they needed to be able to manage the fishery well. Canby is a first-generation crabber 
who became addicted to it when he trot lined for a summer during college. When I was in college, instead of working at McDonald's or somewhere at the snowball stand, I started crabbing in the summer trot line and graduated from Millersville University with a bachelor's of science and uh, went to work for DNR and their water quality team. Left the state after three years and started working um, my way up all pots and had a smaller boat and just kind of went through and got bigger and bigger to where I am today. Typically have anywhere from 900 to 1,200 pots in the water. I think DNR is doing a good job of managing the fishery, keeping us in, in check to, to where we can start to look at other things now and really, really put the blame where it belongs. It's not on watermen. It's it's uh, the water quality. It's it's sewage treatment plants. It's um, stormwater runoff. Um, they've maintained uh, our seasons. Uh, so that we could, we could go out and make a living, but also still not take too many and not, not over harvest. Waterman will tell you the lower bay, with its expansive waters and crab habitats, is good for catching. The upper bay, with its dense urban and suburban populations, is good for selling. So it is that around Smith and Tangier Islands, the business model remains the old one of catching and selling to middlemen who dictate the market price and ship to retail markets. By contrast, Canby spends his afternoons and evenings taking his crabs direct to retail customers in the populous suburbia of northern Anne Arundel County. The money's better going direct. I spend a lot of my evening driving around to different places selling my crabs, but in the end of the season it adds up to give me the best possible income. Eliminating the middleman is one way crabbers to fish for dollars, as Ken Smith puts it. Another way, he says, is to wait for the crabs to fatten up before harvesting them. The watermen's out here catching this trash crab, what I call it, instead of putting it back in the water and letting it fatten up where he can get a better price for the crab. I mean, it's just, we've got to start fishing for dollars, and that's what we're not doing. Even with full participation in the electronic reporting system, Counting crabs is an inexact science. Latent or unused licenses are one challenge. The Maryland DNR says there are about 5,000 licensed commercial crabbers in Maryland, but only a fraction of those licenses are being used full time. So if the rest of the license holders decided to jump back in suddenly when, say, the, the winter survey forecast a good season coming up, that could cause a real nightmare scenario for management. Then there's recreational crabbers where catch reporting is sketchy at best. I'm a recreational crabber from Redline, Pennsylvania, and we come down here about once a week. And we went out of the dock about 5.30 this morning, had a real nice bushel by 7.15, and a second bushel by about 9.30. DNR estimates about 8% of the total bay catch comes from recreational crabbers. Willie Warner learned about these from the late Lester Lee a trot liner on Kent Island who called them no good chicken neckers. Yes, sir. How are you doing today? Okay. Uh, some chicken necks, please. Lester was talking about outsiders and rank amateurs, since there is a widespread belief among dilettante crabbers that chicken necks are the best crab bait. But there is only one bait which professionals invariably use. If the price isn't too high, this is the eel or rather generous bite-sized chunks of salted eel. Amateurs simply refuse to believe this. Young Will Wirtz is no amateur, but he prefers razor clams. Eels have gotten way too expensive for bait. He learned crabbing from the veterans at Schnaitman's on the Y River. My name is Will Wirtz, I'm 14 years old. And I'm the best crabber there is. Will's little neighbor moved in up the road a few years ago and started helping us a little bit and really took to us and we took to him. He's got a lot of interest in the outdoors and, and boats. About two years ago, we started hanging out down here at the landing and all these watermen surrounded me and I learned a whole lot about crabbing and fishing on the water. We helped him out getting a little bit better boat, an engine, and he on his own went out and just started trying to catch a few crabs. I've been baiting lines for other crabbers and doing it all day long. And work for a motor and a boat and put it on there and upgraded another motor. 
last week or so, I bought a l even larger one. He's uh, outgoing and willing to learn and eager to try. I, mean, I used to have a, a, a itty bitty eight foot John boat that me and my friend would go out with traps just being stupid, but didn't really work. So Billy rigged me up with this. And now I got a motor. And now I have this. Yeah, it's really pretty almost every day. It's just great to look at and stuff. I like to be out there and just look at everything and take it in, but you catch crabs, it's even better. Almost all big, beautiful, black, hard crabs in the wide river. Well, I'm not really making any money right now because I don't have a commercial license yet. I could have leased one out, but I didn't feel like spending money. So I'm just doing it for whatever and giving the crabs away for free. I can't even see anything. The water's so murky up here. First haul. Not bad. Take that every haul. I feel pretty privileged and like, not like one of those other kids just sitting down playing video games all day, sitting on the couch, but it's all work. It's like a 16 hour day, it's boring. I can't really talk because I'm not full time, but if I did as much as these other guys did, I'd probably be dead, but right now, I like to stay out very long, just, it's kind of fun. I've learned how to tell where fish and crabs would be by knowing the bottom and structure and what makes their bee crabs, like tides and currents, and I've learned a whole lot about everything. It's not like I'm gonna be a waterman for a living because it's probably not gonna be a single crab in the river in 10 years, but oh, I mean, I don't know, I hope it is. Just thinking, work on the water somehow and not as a waterman, but do that part-time, maybe have a license and like on the weekends or something, maybe just do that. So close to being known. Full-time, just like maybe a DNR officer or marine biologist or something where I can be on the water more often. Well, you, you think about the future of crabbing, it, it's pretty clear you don't have to go back 40 years that there are a lot fewer crabbers out here than there used to be. And you look at the average age of watermen, which is up there, and you wonder, you know, who's going to be crabbing in the future? But the other side of that is, uh, can you imagine a time when a lot of people aren't going to pay a lot of money to uh, get their crab cakes and crab imperial and Maryland crab soup? I can't. So somebody's going to be catching crabs. Our science and potential to manage crabs and the crab industry have improved dramatically. We can envision, without much stretching, a world-class, sustainable fishery here on the Chesapeake for these savory, beautiful swimmers. If we fail, it's not going to be because we didn't know how. Our last words from William Warner on the state of crabs in the Chesapeake came in a new edition of Beautiful Swimmers in 1993. Listen carefully to his concluding words, because we might say much the same thing now, something I find more than a little sobering. A few years ago, before addressing the Maryland State Legislature in support of Governor Harry Hughes' program for the Bay, I called up my waterman friend, Morris Goodwin Marsh, on Smith Island for a first-hand report on how he viewed the Bay's condition. I got some good news for a change, Marsh told me. The eelgrass is coming back. Of course, there's only one problem with this. Those legislators over in Annapolis are going to take credit for what God has wrought. I somehow felt our conversation should not end at this point, and so asked Morris Goodwin how the oyster season was going or how his colleagues farther north up the bay were making out. It was true, he replied, that it was a bad year for oysters and that his friends up north were faring very poorly. In fact, things in general just didn't seem to be going in the right direction. 
Eventually, therefore, we came to agree that God could always use a little help. So it is. The problem is people. Nature, or the supreme deity, has endowed the Chesapeake with a remarkable resilience, a remarkable ability to restore its resources. But only if people do right by the bay. The time is now. William W. Warner, Washington, D.C., August 1993.